London has always had criminals. The largest city in Britain is like a magnet to anyone wanting to make a bob or two, even if that means taking the law into their own hands. Since the 1900s, as many as 70 gangs have fought it out on London's streets. Gun battles, knife crime, gang rivalries and alliances, robberies, protection and drug dealing. The city has seen them all. The most gang-infested district of London has been the East End. To some, a deviant area, one of physical and moral disorder. To others, it's both a kingdom and a gold mine. London has never bowed to one boss. As a city made up of many villages, it's always had many gangs. We're going to look at two gangs, past and present, both caught up in the urban battle for survival. Gangs have come and gone in London, the Second World War putting pay to many of them. The Sabinis from Clerkenwell, a mob not unlike the Mafia, flourished for almost 20 years, but by the 40s they were gone. The Elephant and Castle mob in the South endured into the 50s. But there was one gang which survived right up until the 1960s, and their origins go back to the 1800s. They were the Watney Streeters. <laughs> Originally an Irish fighting gang, the Watney Streeters owed their success and survival to one thing, the river. It enabled them to make a good living from the docks which sprung up beside its banks. To find out about the Watney Streeters, I've come to meet author and historian James Morton. So James, I think we should talk about the history of the docks first. Well, the, the docks, uh, of course, have been here since people started importing stuff into England. But, I mean, one of the principal times was the 18th century when really sort of the pool of London between London Bridge and Tower Bridge uh, was taking something like 1500 ships at a time when it was really only designed for 600 and there were tremendous opportunities for theft from uh, those ships which were not properly guarded, not policed. The cargoes which were coming in were ivory, furs, tea, uh, coffee, anything and anything could be stolen and was. And what sort of people uh, were working on the docks? Well, generally speaking, an awful lot were Irish uh, immigrants who'd come over, certainly in the 18th century and also in the 19th century, particularly after the potato famines of the 1840s. The Irish immigrants really settled around Wapping. Somehow, um, there would have been lots of stealing going on from around the docks and various small gangs and families who, who did those sort of things. Eventually, they all sort of came together, didn't they? Yes, certainly the, the most powerful collection were the Watney Streeters, and they were the people who controlled the docks, who got work on them, who could get a ticket later on to work regularly, who was picked for casual labour, uh, and so on. And they were, to a large extent, they were fighting gangs. So how did they make their money? Well, they, they, of course, they were paid a wage for a start, but there was, uh, as with any docks, if you have a dock, you've got enormous opportunities for theft. They could, the people who controlled the union could also decide who worked there. And so consequently, if you wanted to work on a dock, you had to pay uh, money to the people running the docks. So what about if other gangs stole things? They... If other gangs, if other people stole things, uh, then really it's the same as the craze down the East End later, the, the, the Watney Streeters would expect to tax them. Perhaps if the property came to, I don't know, say 20 pounds, they'd want a fiver, that sort of thing. During 1919, 1,500 people were arrested for cargo poaching. The shipping police was formed to oversee cargoes being loaded and unloaded, but the stealing went on. Thieving from ships was almost customary. The theft of rum was prevalent. One method, known as sucking the monkey, was where they would siphon off the alcohol from the barrel using a hose. A second technique called spiking the cask involved simply drilling holes in the keg. 
and having extra long pockets sewn inside their trousers was a neat way of hiding any stolen goods from the day. During the First World War, pilfering was organized by the older dockers. They hired lads to do their dirty work. The boys could earn four pounds a week when a normal wage was only 12 shillings. To the streeters, it was more money for old rope. While the Irish immigrants settled down by the docks, a hundred years later, a new wave of Asian immigrants were arriving in London. This is Southall in West London. In the 1950s, Indian and Pakistani immigrants came here to find jobs in the factories and at the airport. Now, 85% of the residents here are Asian. The influx of Asians gave rise to the likes of the Teddy Boys and a much more powerful groups like the National Front. The Asians had to defend themselves, so they formed gangs. Now, one of these gangs was called the Tutti Nung. I'm meeting up with a man who has done a lot of research into this, journalist and crime writer, Tony Thompson. First of all, tell me about when did uh, gangs first emerge in this area? Well, around the Southall area, they really started around the late 60s, early 70s, which was around the same time that we started to get a large population of people from the Indian subcontinent coming to this part of London and setting up shop here. Uh, so, um, in the early days when they were being here, there was a lot of racism, a lot of uh, people being attacked by um, uh, sort of people like the National Front and so on. And uh, they started to defend themselves by gathering together in vigilante gangs to defend themselves against the racists. Uh, but what happened was once, once the threat from the racists started to fade a little bit, those gangs stayed around, started attacking each other and started preying on the local community themselves. What happened a lot of the time was that they would go to shop owners and local businesses and demand protection money, uh, saying that you know um, they would help them to uh, prevent being attacked by racists and so on and, and guard their properties. Yeah. Um, and once so they were attacking their own community, really. Yeah, I mean they, they started off defending them, but then they went into attacking them once the actual problem disappeared because they still wanted to be around and they thought, well, we might as well make some money out of this, and slowly moved into organised crime. It's actually exactly what happened with the mafia in Sicily as well. They started off the same way, being a group of vigilantes who, once the threat had gone, ended up becoming an organised crime group. Initially, the gang was known as the Holy Smokes, but caste divisions within it created a rift. So, so the Holy Smokes in the 70s, they were the big gang, the big Asian gang, and they, uh, they split at one point, didn't they? Yeah, what happened is that um, the whole Indian community has a, a big problem with, um, with caste. If you're the wrong caste, you can't sort of associate with people of a different caste. And within the Holy Smokes, they had several different castes. And uh, some of the people at the, in the lower caste felt they weren't being treated properly by those in the higher caste. So they ended up going off and forming their own gang, which they called the Tutti Nungs. They saw themselves as being from the lowest caste. Tutti Nung means the worthless ones. Where there had been unity, there was now bitterness and rivalry between the Tutti Nung and the Holy Smokes. To find out about the consequences of this rift, I'm going along to see Dr Avtar Litt, founder of Sunrise Radio, which has been here in Southall since the 80s. The radio station is kind of part of, it's really a centre of a community, right? So when was the first time you heard about the Tutti Nung, the, the Holy Smokes? Well, we used to run a radio station from the marketplace, which is about, you know, um, in the sort of early 80s, um, right from the heart of the town. And, um, and we used to play uh, dedications and songs to Tutti Nung, the Holy Smokes, young girls to call up to say, you know, this is this next song for so-and-so. We didn't know who they were. Um, we, I came from outside Southall. And it was just a normal broadcast. You know, yeah. It's like a, a, a daughter sending a um, um, dedication to an auntie or something. Yeah. And it's only later on we found out that Tutti Nungs and Holy Smokes were really local sort of mini gangsters, you know, sort of, so sort to of speak. You know, uh, the Holy Smokes, for example, uh, they were made of youngsters. And uh, one would like to think that the pillars of the community mm. uh, w w w would be there to give guidance and disperse. But in this particular case, they actually fostered those gangs. Unlike most outfits that grow from the street upwards, this gang was formed and nurtured by the elders from the top down. The local community actually had a legitimate way of making money. There were community organisations at the time. Control of those, those community organisations became very important. Yeah. And this is how gang culture was actually encouraged by the members of the community. Uh, older members of the community, the pillars of society, the kind of people who would sit at the uh, local superintendent, police or super, uh, superintendent's office to sort out the community problems. 
So it was ingrained quite deep, the oh, whole yeah, gang absolutely. culture. It was actually encouraged by the community yeah. elders. They did it uh, not because they want lawlessness in the, um, uh, in the community or in the country or, or in the town. They did it because that was their muscle, effectively, yes, you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah. in order to control an organization. Yeah. But, but you see, basically, this is not um, something new to the Asian culture. I mean, if you look at mm. the Indian cities of Bombay and all the rest of it, it is almost customary that, you know, a shopkeeper would actually pay the local gang protection money on a weekly basis. It happens today. And you can't even escape from it, you know. Mm. Most members of the public didn't know anything about it. But I think, you know, in the late, in the early 80s, uh, it's you know people starting to fear if somebody would say well you know I'm I, I'm a so -and -so, gang member so and so yeah. people would shy away from challenging that person. So if you were a kid, would you choose to be either one or the other, or or were you born into it almost? I think they were actively rec actively recruiting uh, people mm. from schools and other things, um, and I think that you know it was almost fashionable uh, to be part of one or the other. Sunrise. It only hit home to Avtar how threatening the gangs were when he realised their influence extended into his own news team. With the journalists so intimidated, they felt unable to even mention the gangs in their reporting. There was uh, one uh, supposed to be head of gang who was um, sent to prison and he, was, uh, he, went, he went inside. And um, my news team actually refused to carry the story because the news team actually, they're all very famous journalists now, but 20 years ago mm. they, were, they were beginners, they worked for local newspapers, they came to work for the yeah. local radio station and I threatened to sack the entire news team simply because because they had gone to school, local schools, they knew how the setup was far more than I did and they said they weren't prepared to carry the news, although the man had been convicted, sent to prison. And they said they, they value their face a lot more than actually um, um, their jobs. Yeah. So they were really controlling the community with fear? Yes. Yes, it was, it was, I think the fear, um, uh, I think they probably did a lot less, but you know, the fear was far greater. But by the 1980s, the fighting between the two gangs became so violent and so public that everyone in Southall became aware of a serious gang problem. I want to know why it got so out of control. Despite the fact that they started off together uh, within the same gang, once they split, they became mortal enemies. Um, I think in some ways it gave them something to do by attacking one another. They'd be vicious battles, I mean, sort of um, like nothing that had ever been seen in the area before. But they'd be involving machetes and, and hammers and screwdrivers and, and all sorts of knives, and people would be often very badly hurt. Um, but these were seen as a, a great source of pride for the gangs as to who would come off better. It was a bit like sort of the worst kind of football hooliganism, you know, these two mass gangs coming together in public and just brawling together. Uh, and it would happen on a regular basis. Were they out to kill each other or...? I think the, the idea was, was never specifically to kill, it was always just to sort of win, win the fight, but some people did die occasionally. Um, but it was more about people getting really badly injured and, and badly hurt as a result of the activities that were going on. The horrors of the street battles prompted ordinary residents to start coming forward and gradually information began to seep out. The police set up a special squad to investigate. It was called Operation Shampoo it would reveal an international organisation of more than 2,000 soldiers with interests in illegal immigration, extortion, fraud, violence, heroin dealing and armed robberies. Operation Shampoo was about to lift the lid off of organised crime in Southall. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. In the early part of the 20th century, London's East End was a patchwork of gangs. In Whitechapel there were the Bessarabians, Russian Jews who went from fighting anti-Semitic violence to running protection rackets. To counter them, there were the Jewish vigilantes called the Odessians. The Blind Beggar Gang was a team of pickpockets from Bethnal Green. 
Street thugs formed into groups and called themselves the Titanics, the Hoxton mob, or the Vendetta mob. There were the Jamaican Eddie Mannings and a Japanese outfit called Sess Miyakawa running drug rings. And then, down beside the river, controlling some of the busiest docks in the world, were the Watney Streeters. Up until the late 40s, they were led by a man called Jimmy Fuller. And this was their manor, Watney Street in Wapping. I'm hoping that James can tell me something about the place. James, here we are on Watney yeah. Street. Yeah. I mean, not quite how it would have been in the 20s. No, in those days it would be back to back, no indoor lavatories, right. um, sort of shed in the back garden, certainly no baths, nothing like that. But, but pubs and shops? Pubs and shops, certainly. I mean, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, uh, it would have had a hundred shops and probably a hundred stalls on a Sunday morning. And a strong Irish And a very strong Irish neighbourhood. I mean, they all married, intermarry. A big Catholic community would intermarry. Uh, I mean, it's always said you never knew who your cousin was uh, because of the intermarriage in those days, at the, as I say, turn of the century. And the, the Watney Street has maintained a presence, certainly, uh, throughout the 1920s, for example, they were used by a man called Arthur Harding, or so he says, to break up uh, part of the general strike. How many people were, were in this gang? I don't know, it's a very loose, amorphous thing. I can't think it's a gang. I think that they were, generally speaking, a fighting community, and if you needed uh, them, they would rally round you. They'd, if they weren't fighting themselves, they'd um, come, right. and, come and help out. Yeah, they were, they were obviously... Fighters to hire. Big, big fighting gang, yes. There were several gangs that the streeters had to fend off. One of them was the Sabinis, a mafia outfit from Clerkenwell. Certainly the story is that they one day ambushed the Sabinis who came on a recce down here, I think, to deal with some bookmakers, and they found that they'd walked into a trap. Uh, and the Watney Street is allegedly, and this would be what, the middle 20s again, uh, gave them a good hiding and sent them back uh, to Clerkenwell. The Streeters had been going for over a century. They made a tidy income. They'd got through the war when others had fallen. They'd survived the loss of their leader, Jimmy Fuller. But now there will be two forces which would bring about their demise. The first of these was out of their control. It was quite simply progress. The docks in Wapping suffered heavy bombing during the war. It wasn't worth rebuilding them, and the ships were now getting much larger. They needed deeper water. Trade was moved downriver to Tilbury. By the 1950s, the London docks were closing. And this street was the heart of it. How did it change uh, once the docks started to... Uh... Well, of course, you've got terrible deprivations in the war. I mean, you've got... Uh, sort of Surrey docks, for example, in the war. One night, 380,000 ton tons of timber was destroyed. So you can think of the, the terrible um, deprivation that the East End suffered. Yes. Uh, after the war, uh, there's a sort of regrouping, but by the 1960s, you're getting container ships and the London docks can't cope with them. They haven't got the depth to cope with them. And so the docks moved down to Tilbury. Right. And consequently, the Watney Street is then, or the people on the docks, start to lose their power. The streeters began to diversify. They work with the Jewish gangs in Allgate, who run the clubs, the brothels, and the gambling joints. They provided protection for them. They'd always had a tough reputation, and they liked to fight. The Watney Streeters had always been enemies of Bethnal Green. They crossed the Sabinis a few times when they were in power there, but the Streeters had always managed to deal with them. Now they faced a new threat, which would eventually lead to their destruction, the Craze. What other types of gangs were coming up through the 50s that were making their lives less easy? I, I don't think they were making their lives less easy. I think, in fact, that the... the, the the families were getting old, they'd made their money, 
Uh, some were moving out, for example, George Cornell, who was killed by Ronnie Cray. Uh, he married a, a girl from South London, went over South London. It, it just sort of generally drifted away. Right, but um, there was a sense that with the, when the Crays came around, that the Crays and, and, and the Watney Streeters were going to meet. The Crays and the Watney Streeters were always going to clash sooner or later, without any doubt. By 1956, the twins were making serious money. They controlled an area from Bethnal Green east to Mile End, Stepney and Bow, and north to Hackney and Walthamstow. Within this area of 14 square miles, every gambling den, most of the pubs and many businesses, down to petty thieves, all paid their dues to the craze. They were already known as the most dangerous mob in London. They would always be a threat to any surviving streeter. And it wasn't long before one of them, called Charlie, attracted their attention. Streeter Charlie would encounter the craze on several occasions. He had a scam going with local post office drivers who would readdress parcels to places where he could collect them. Ronnie Cray, hearing of the potential of the post office scam, demanded 50% of the profits. Charlie was not forthcoming with any money. He became listed by Ronnie as someone he would soon have to deal with severely. Ronnie's violent hatred towards anyone coming into his manor would lead him in the autumn of 1956 to use a gun and shoot someone for the first time. One of the Watley Streeters, uh, a friend of his, has a run-in with a garage uh, who sold him a dud car. And uh, he creates a bit of um, difficulty with the, the vendor of the car, putting it absolutely neutrally. Uh, Red Ronnie won't have this, and he, he shot the man in the leg. He shot the docker in the leg. Was the, the garage was playing protection to the craze at that point, I take it? Yes, that would be uh, the way of putting it. I, I think in, Ronnie would always say it was a friend of his, but I have a horrid feeling that money was exchanged for the friendship. And do you think Ronnie did this because he wanted to show other gangs, the Watney Streeters, of his power? Yes, but of course Ronnie was completely out of control anyway, even back then. And whereas another person would have just given him a bad beating or perhaps a cutting, uh, Ronnie took it that one stage further. But it was it was the it was these moments in Ronnie's these career. Are these are defining moments. Where yes. he never had to be violent again. Once the, once the, it fired those guns in those first few years of yes. his career, he could live off that. That's right. And uh, anyway, eventually, just to show his power, he has a whip round in the East End, and uh, the, the docker is bought a pub or a share in a pub. And it shows that really sort of the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. It's a charity as well. But what happened? Did Ronnie get caught for this? There was an identification parade, uh, and no one was picked out, surprisingly enough. Because legend has it that Reggie turned up that day. Reggie turned up and was going to say, if he was picked out, oh, I'm Reggie, and would foul up the identification parade anyway, but it never came to it. The fix was in. To the Watney Streeters, this was just a foretaste of what was to come. The Crays were a new breed of criminal, unpredictable, violent and ruthless. Their hunger for power knew no bounds, and they were about to unleash violence of a type never before seen in the city. In Southall at the end of the 80s, there was another gang flexing its muscles, the Tutti Nun. They may not be so well known as the Craze, but they soon became every bit as powerful. One man who had been on the receiving end of their threats was a Greenford shopkeeper called Marinda Palmer. Shortly after depositing his life savings of £20,000 into a local building society, two young Asian men walked into his shop, asked him to come outside for what they said was a business proposition. He was directed into the back seat of a car and a gun was pointed to his head. One of them said, we're the Tutti Nun. You know how important we are. 
and we want £20,000. It's a simple choice. You either pay us the money or we kill you and we feed you to our dog. Mahinda Palmer withdrew the £20,000 and handed it over one week later. Worried that the gang knew exactly how much he had in his account and terrified that they would return, he phoned the police. I'm meeting up with the man he spoke to, former detective superintendent Roy Herridge. Tell me about Mahinda Palmer and his part. Well, I understand that Mr Palmer was being put under a number of threats in his shop, um, and it appeared to be protection. Now, I know <clears throat> my officers investigated that, and in the end, the case finished up at the, the Crown Court, where um, people were uh, prosecuted and dealt with. That was one of the first people that came over and gave us information as what was going on. And I think after we dealt with the individuals who were dealing with Palmer, then the public had confidence in the team that were investigating matters. And from that time onwards, a lot more information stemmed yeah. from that one inquiry. The courage of Mr Palmer going to the police opened a tiny crack in a vast criminal organisation. But this hadn't brought the Tutinung down because the structure of the gang meant it was almost impossible to penetrate. It's actually a very similar way to the way that terrorist cells work, and that you have a, an inner organisation and you have these independent cells, and if you bust one of the cells, you haven't broken up the organisation at all, you've just taken out that one cell. And, and these gangs are kind of started working from that model. Uh, so if the police did ever have any success and find a few gang members and find out what they were doing and arrest them or put them away, the rest of the organisation was completely isolated and could still carry on independently. By the late 1980s, the inroads made by the police had shown that there was a hierarchy to the gang. At its heart lay a group of powerful men. Up until now, they had remained untouchable. It was this inner circle that Operation Shampoo set out to crack. It would unearth one of the largest heroin smuggling operations ever discovered in Britain. By the mid-50s, the Crays had control of the East End. Now they wanted a slice of the action up west. But the Watney Streeter called Charlie, who had crossed them before, would jeopardise their plans. In 1956, friends of the Crays called Jones and Ramsey took over a drinking club in Soho called the Stragglers Club. Jones and Ramsey called in the twins to handle any troublemakers. Reggie and Ronnie were delighted to form a partnership with them. But like a bad penny, the Watney Streeter, Charlie, would reappear. Jones got into an argument with him, and Charlie beat him up severely. Now his business partner, Ramsey, together with the Cray twins, would retaliate with a merciless attack. So, James, this is where the fight happened at the Britannia. It's now a perfect fried chicken place. Absolutely. It's just, of course, by the Shadwell railway station. And this is where Reggie, Ronnie, uh, Billy Jones and Bobby Ramsey came looking for the Watney Streeters who had done up Ramsey. What happened was the Streeters got wind that the Craze mob was on its way. Uh, in the front was a, a, a fellow who got nothing to do with it but was related to the Streeters, a man called Terry Martin. Out the back go the Watley Streeters, whom the Crays are really looking for. And uh, there is poor old Terry Martin in front, uh, left really more or less on his own. He's dragged out and given a stabbing with the bayonet. By who? By you know. Bobby, uh, and possibly Bobby Ramsey. It's difficult to know who really does what, but they all give him a terrible so hammer. Just here on this just pavement? Just here on this pavement, yeah. And where the Watney Streeters are, are uh, have, have decamped, yes, very sensibly. Interesting, but it sent out quite a big signal to the Watney Streeters. It this. did, and instead of having taken their revenge on Terry Martin, they then went looking for these cowardly Watley Streeters to give them a lesson. I think Bobby Ramsey runs a traffic light, and in those days you might find people, uh, police on the street. 
and they're pulled over and there's a, a blood-stained bayonet and various other ammunition and equipment in the car. There's some blood on Reggie's tie, which he explains to the court when they go to the Old Bailey, that it, um, it had come from a, a nosebleed while he was watching a boxing match. It was somebody else's blood that lent out of the ring and there's the no jury DNA. wore it and there was no DNA, no DNA. in those days. Um, Ronnie gets three years, um, Jones and Ramsey get five and three years. The Cray twins were tried for assault on Terry Martin. Their attempt to bribe him had failed. In court, the jury accepted that the blood stains on Reggie's jacket might have come from boxing in the gym, and he was acquitted. Ronnie had no such luck. He took the fall and went off for his first stretch in prison for three years. Ramsey got five, Jones three. The Stragglers Club was shut down. The Crays were out there getting their hands dirty, but the outfit I'm looking at, a Hindu gang called the Tuti Nung, is a totally different setup. On the street level, there's intense gang rivalry, but at the top, the bosses delegate. They don't fight, they work together. They're not interested in rivalry, they're interested in making money. The inner circle at the top scoops up all of the money from their scams and puts it all into the big money maker, heroin. The inner circle of the Tutti Nam were always removed from their crimes. Insulated, you could almost say untouchable. But there's always that one fatal slip, that little chink in the armour. And in this case, when it appeared, Roy Herridge and his team on Operation Shampoo jumped on it. As well as making around 80 arrests among the Tutti Nam, Operation Shampoo also stumbled upon more senior gang members. One of them, called Barkat Khan, began to bribe witnesses. How does Barkat Khan fit into all of this? But once the police started Operation Shampoo, they obviously had a number of court cases that resulted. Uh, in one of those cases, one of the witnesses was bribed, and the person who was accused of putting the bribes in was this character called Barkat Khan. Yeah. Uh, as a result of that, the police then started following him to see what he was involved in, and it turned out that he was a massive heroin smuggler on a scale that the police had never really come across before. Certainly in this part of London, no one had ever been operating on that kind of scale. The Khan case gave a real insight into the methods used by gangs to import heroin. The distribution was through gang-owned restaurants who can safely import large quantities of goods from India and Pakistan on a regular basis. They have a high cash turnover, extensive storage space, and no one ever looked suspicious going into a restaurant. Barkat Khan ran a highly sophisticated, well-planned and lucrative operation. All the money the Tutinam made, in their other frauds and scams, the protection money, the credit cards, the bogus mortgages, was all invested into a massive and regular smuggling operation of heroin into Heathrow Airport. It involved a vast network of gang members, men and women, all working together. It all depended upon couriers, trusted friends or families from the gang, and usually women. They would be flown out of Heathrow to India or Pakistan. They would usually go for a few weeks and be able to visit their families and have a paid holiday. But on their return, they would bring back heroin. Boarding and body checks in Pakistan could be easily avoided. The gang wielded considerable power there officials could be bribed to turn a blind eye. But it was the return trip to Heathrow where the gang's ingenuity and planning would be critical. With vigilant customs officials and the latest scanning devices, it would be risky trying to smuggle the drugs through customs. But the Tutti Nung had a simple, undetectable and foolproof solution. When the couriers entered the baggage reclaim area, they would slip off to the ladies' toilets. There, they would remove the packages of heroin. Each courier had been given a key to the tampon dispenser. Here, the drugs were hidden, and the courier, now totally clean, could pass through customs and leave the airport. Now, there was just one more link in the operation. The gang had people employed at the airport as cleaners. As soon as the couriers had cleared, 
Their job was now to move and pick up the drugs. Once in their hands, it was no problem to take the drugs out of the airport. With so many people regularly going back and forth, nothing looked out of the ordinary. This operation didn't raise any suspicions. That must have involved the gang being everywhere, right? Working in airports. Yeah, I mean, what they did was they actually got gang members to go and get jobs in specific places if they knew that it would be useful to them in terms of getting drugs into the country. So it was a very sophisticated operation from that point of view. And police believe that he was bringing in about 10 kilos of heroin a day. How which much is that? It was about 100,000 pounds a day. But they reckon it was um, operating for about 10 years wow. before they discovered it. So we're talking millions and millions of pounds that his gang was making. Um, all of which was coming into the, into the UK at heroin and being spread out within this community and within the rest of London as well. The Tutti Nung were bringing in 10 kilos a day, worth £100,000. They did this for 10 years. That's £365 million. That's the proceeds of all those bank cards and PIN numbers that went missing in the post. All those bogus mortgages and insurance scams. All those threatened shopkeepers. All collected up and invested in drug trafficking. The tentacles of this operation stretch into every corner of everyday life, creating misery for every person they touch. On November the 5th, 1956, Ronnie Cray entered Wandsworth Prison to start a three-year sentence. During that time, he was moved to Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight and also the psychiatric wing of Winchester Prison. By his release in spring 1959, he would be certified insane. But three years away hadn't erased Ronnie's memory. He hadn't forgotten the culprits who he'd wanted to hunt down the night he was caught. The Watney Streeters. And so the legend goes, in spring 1959, Ronnie and Reggie and the rest of the firm came down here to the London Hospital Tavern Inside drinking were the Watney Streeters. This time, there will be no escape. Ronnie and the firm stormed in, and the beating they gave the Watney Streeters was severe. The following day, the newspapers described it as the worst gang fight in the East End for years. Not long after that, the leader of the Streeters asked Reggie for a job. It was the end of the Watney Streeters. But they lived on as individuals, many of them joining rival gangs. And I think that um, the Maltese who are coming into the area at the time, sort of the commercial road and so on, running clubs and spielers and indeed running girls, uh, they are starting to pay money to what's left of the Watney Streeters, who in turn are paying it to the craze. And they're all moving out now of the area. The docks yes. are diminishing. The docks are now... And they're older. The 60s are gone, yes. The, they've made their money. They're going respectable. Uh, they're moving out of Dockland, out to Essex, to Basildon, Romford, places like that. But there would be one more murder. The final nail to be hammered into the Watney Streeters' coffin. And eventually, Ronnie... Uh, kills one of the Watney Streeters and George Cornell. Yes. Now, George Cornell uh, has moved. He's one of the ones who's actually gone over to the South London and aligned himself with the Richardsons. Cornell comes over to meet a man uh, whom actually it was suggested Ronnie had shot as well. He comes over to visit him in hospital and uh, thinks he'll have a drink out of, presumably out of bravado and sheer folly in, in the blind beggar in the Mile End Road, yeah. and that is when Ronnie gets wind of this, decides who's going to be shown to be the master of the East End and goes in and in front of a, really only the barmaid and one other elderly man um, pulls the trigger on Cornell. Here at the Blind Beggar Pub in 1968, Ronnie shot George Cornell, a man who'd once been a Watney Streeter. And the rest, as they say, is history. The Watney Streeters were never seen again. In Southall, Operation Shampoo had unearthed a massive smuggling operation, bringing 100,000 pounds of heroin into Heathrow Airport every day. It had been run by a man in the inner circle of the Tutti Nung gang. His name, 
was Barkat Khan. How did they catch him in the end? But they caught him because they, they found out about him from the uh, the bribe that he tried to make for the witness. Once they started oh, following right, him, yeah, yeah. they, they realised what was going on. Uh, I mean, Barkat's Khan problem, uh, Barkat Khan's problem was that he didn't like delegating stuff, so he was always very hands-on. He was always there to supervise what was going on. So when the police started following him, it was immediately obvious what he was involved in, and uh, he got a long sentence as a result. The police operation in Southall had taken the lid off a massive crime organisation. Khan was convicted of attempting to import heroin. He got four years. By 1989, prominent members of the Tutti Nang had become exposed, and more local residents came forward with information to rid gangs from the neighbourhood and from the lives of their children. Well, I think really a lot of the parents wanted their children to be dealt with in order, because they are a very, very law-abiding society in normal life, but these youngsters seem to move away from that society and become gang members. And the parents, a lot of parents came forward to help us. What happened to Shampoo in the end? Well, in Operation Shampoo um, finished, um, just before I retired, actually. And, and I think, really, at that stage, um, we'd come to a virtual end of our inquiry. I think we dealt with the major part of the Tutti Nuns and Holy Smokes, and I think if you speak to the community now, those individuals have been dealt with as far as the law is concerned and have come out and have very happy, straightforward families now and have good businesses. So how many, in the end, were put into prison? I think about 40 people overall were put to prison and overall I think we dealt with about 80 individuals overall, yeah. Today, Avtar Lip believes that most youngsters have other aspirations. He thinks they now look towards building careers rather than joining gangs. I think there has been, um, um, in the last few years, uh, people who have recently arrived from India or whatever, mm. uh, they think they've got four or five people put together, they can actually put pressure on the others, but they're not gangs as they were, uh, you know, the, in the 80s. They no longer have the glass ceilings which they used to have mm. in 1780s. Uh, I think people that's now... That's true, that's a really good point. Uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, people, uh, people feel they can achieve anything now, you know, so, so therefore, uh, the same people who were probably members of the gang they're probably coaching their daughters and sons to become accountants not, and doctors, not, um, the, not gangsters. But Tony Thompson is less optimistic. So the Tutti Nung are finished, but completely? I think Operation Shampoo definitely shut them down for a while, but like all of these things, um, they only, only really became more sophisticated and realised what they needed to do to not get caught in the future. So I think they're still around. They just keep a much lower profile, um, they're not quite so showy and they're not quite so obvious, but they're still there and they're still making money. Well, I think what's interesting about youth gangs these days is that it's become a kind of career path. It used to be a sort of phase that you went through. You'd be in a gang, you'd hang out with your mates, and when you got to 18 or so, you'd give up because there was no money in it. But now, even at a young age, you can make a lot more money out of being in a street gang than you can from doing a legitimate job. So a lot of these young kids end up um, just on the first step of a career ladder that takes them into more serious crime, into armed robbery, into major league drug dealing by the time they're in their 20s. Southall is ever-changing. Just as the British and the Irish moved further out in the 1950s, so now the Sikh population followed them. New communities are moving in from Somalia and Afghanistan. The area is becoming more diverse. Heroin still plagues the Southall community and the country at large. Because of gangs like the Tutti Nun, the price of a gram of heroin has dropped from £100 to £40, while the purity has doubled. Since the millennium, a new generation of gangs have developed. They're fragmented, less organised, and nothing on the same scale as the Tutti Nun. But perhaps that's just appearances. Perhaps we can't see what's really there. All we know is that drugs are still on the street cheaper than ever, so someone's still bringing them in.